Let's set in a comfortable meditation posture and close the eyes. Let's put our attention on the silence that is always there deep in the mind. Connect with that silence. Become the silent. You are the silent witness. Now listen to the Yoga Vashishta from the silent witness. Book 4, Chapter 38, continuing with verse 9. The minds of those who know the soul come to the state of perfect detachment from their desire. Just as when a false mirage of water is set down by raining clouds and particles of morning dews are dried up by the raging sun. It is then that the soul is said to rest in its perfect bliss, to realize. This is not the joy of the gusto of pleasure or the pain of sorrow or discontent. It does not consist of the liveliness of living beings or the inertness of stone. It is not situated in the midst of these opposites, but in the knowing mind, the silent witness, which is all rapture and ecstasy and infinite bliss. But the thirst of an ignorant mind leads it to the moving waters of earthly pleasures. Just like an elephant is misled to a foul pool where he is plunged in its mud and mire without finding anything that is really good. Here's another example based upon the stanza in the scriptures, which says, a man dreaming himself to be falling into a pit feels the fear of his fall in his imagination, even when he has been sleeping in his bed. But another who actually falls in a pit when he is fast asleep is quite unconscious of his fall. Thus it is the mind which paints its own pleasure and pains and not the bodily actions or its inactivity. So this is a perfect example of why living in the moment is living in bliss, infinite bliss. Whereas living at any other point in the past or the future is fraught with misery. So when we live in the moment, we are completely devoid of the mind. The mind is completely quiet. 
Because the only way we can live in the moment is to be established in the silent witness. And the only way to become established in the silent witness is to have no individual karmic traces off-gassing thoughts into the mind. So when we have the bliss of the silent witness, there is no karmic traces to produce. The imagination of fear of the fall. Hence, whether a man is the doer of an action or not, he perceives nothing of it when his mind is engrossed in some other thought or action. But he sees everything in himself who beholds. everything in the abstract meditation of his mind. And the silent witness, the thinking mind sees outward objects as reflections that are cast out from his pure consciousness. Thus the man, knowing the noble soul, knows himself to be inaccessible to the feelings of pleasure and pain. Knowing this as a certainty, he finds that nothing exists apart from what is within the container of his soul. which is as minute as a thousand part of a hair. This being ascertained, he views everything in himself. With this certainty of knowledge, he comes to know his self as a reflection of all things, present in all of them. After these determinations, he comes to the conclusion that he is not subject to pain or pleasure, thus freed from anxieties. The mind freely exercises its powers over all customary duties without being concerned about. So this is a description of how the individual in moksha continues to act. <laughs> moksha level one, two, and three. The body is not devoid of karmic traces. But now moksha level four, interesting. The body is completely connected with divine karmic traces. <coughs> so the individual acting in moksha level one, two, and three is going to be a situation in which the action is driven by karmic traces. And 
and the individual established in the silent witness observes how the body moves about. And the individual who is established in the silent witness is still interested in the physical body and connected with it. The connection comes from the karmic traces. So the individual established in the silent witness, but not yet in Brahman consciousness, has a special situation. In this state, the influences of karmic traces are there and may create actions to further their existence. So the individual who is established in these first three levels of moksha must be constantly inhibiting the body from doing everything that it wants to do. It is watching and witnessing the body, but using a discrimination that it knows this act that the body wants to do, being driven by individual karmic traces, will lead to disruption, disturbance in the universe, leading to more karma. Now the actions that the body in Kali Yuga wants to perform, once the bliss of the silent witness is established, are fairly easy for the individual to resist if they're not in accord with divine karmic traces. But if the individual loses the physical body, then he finds himself in the celestial realms with quite a perfect and beautiful body surrounded by unimagined beauty. The thing about beauty the beauty found on the earth plane in Kali Yuga is about one thousandth the beauty found in the celestial regions. Becoming extremely difficult to resist. Beauty creates a false longing, desire for unity. When one witnesses something beautiful, one wants to become that beautiful thing.
this creates entanglement in the illusion because the beauty is illusory. It's a little bit like what happens in the physical in Kali Yuga. When one becomes enamored with a movie star. People acting in movies. Have been engineered to express great beauty with makeup and costumes, lighting, etc. So it's common for the people watching the movie to become enamored with the movie star. Well, in the celestial regions, everyone is a movie star. So it's extremely challenging to maintain the inward focus required to finish the balancing of the individual karmic traces once one arrives in the ultra beautiful celestial realm. The result is, having arrived in the celestial realms, not established in Brahman consciousness, At some point, the beauty overwhelms. The individual loses connection with the silent witness, actually voluntarily gives it up to connect with the beauty of the illusory environment. The result, of course, is one becomes lost in the samsara. And soon finds himself back into the cycles of reincarnation. Just like the story of Shukra, which we read only a few chapters back. Then here we go again. So moksha is only permanent from reincarnation in the earth plane guaranteed if Brahman consciousness is achieved. Otherwise, the stay in the celestial realms will be temporary and the whole charade will reenact once again. Hence, The challenge is, how do we achieve Brahman consciousness while still in a physical body in Kali Yuga? We have to create a special environment for ourselves where we are surrounded with other people who are also 
very intent on achieving Brahman consciousness. Where the environment is pleasant, but nowhere near the extraordinary beauty of a celestial realm. And where we have enough time to focus our attention on the balancing of our karmic traces. All these ingredients must come together if we're to achieve Roman consciousness. The story of Swami Brahmananda Saraswati. helps to illustrate this. There is someone who at the age of nine realized he's in need of a guru and in need of balancing individual karmic traces to achieve Brahman consciousness. And so he spent 50 years in total isolation in the forest with only the wild animals as companions. So that was his path to achieve Roman consciousness. That's a bit difficult for almost everyone right now in Kali Yuga. So we have our communities to answer that need. Now we continue established in the silent witness begin the esoteric Mahamantra Trimana Sanyama practice. And quickly balance all individual karmic traces that have been enlivened by today's reading.
Jai Guru Jai.